starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have the Godzilla shark. With a name like that, this creature is surely anything but disappointing. About 300 million years ago these guys ruled the sea and were one of the most terrifying sea creatures ever on our planet. Fossils of these guys have been found in the Manzano Mountains which lie east of Albuquerque, New Mexico and they were found in 2013 by paleontologist John Paul Hodnett. So think of a massive shark, but now picture it covered in scales, like a reptile. Ok, now add 12 rows of super sharp teeth and also the largest dorsal fin spines of any shark that has ever lived. Ok, now you've pretty much got the Godzilla shark. It was nicknamed the Godzilla shark because of its size as the skeleton is the largest fossil of its kind ever discovered in the area as well as the fact that its fin spines are so intriguing to look at. While it was called the Godzilla shark upon its discovery it has since received a more official name of Hoffman's dragon shark, both to honour the family that owned the land where the skeleton was found and as an homage to its monstrous and reptilian appearance. In our number 9 spot today we have the Shastasaurus. This extinct genus of Ichthyosaurus is one of the largest marine reptiles known, growing to be 21 meters long. One of the most interesting things about these guys is that they were quite specialized because they had quite a wild food preference. These guys had a thirst for squid. A study of their fossils revealed that they had short snouted skulls which has led experts to believe that their jaws had the ability to open extremely quickly and very wide. This happened so fast it created a sort of vacuum inside of their mouth sucking in anything that was in front of it. These guys didn't bother with teeth or strong jaws, they didn't need a crazy bite force or really to even move that quickly. They basically just needed to swim over to wherever their desired squid was hanging out and uh, open their mouth. In our number 8 spot today we have the Dunkleosteus. Dunkle Dunkleosteus. I don't know man. This creature was a genus of Plasoderm which is a class of fish that has been extinct for around 360 million years. These ancient swimmers had osteoderms which means that they had these plates of exposed bone that served as protection, it's like a built in armour. These guys were some of the largest and most powerful Plasoderms ever and it had a terrifying ability that made it quite a worthy predator. It was their insanely powerful bite force which has been estimated to be about 7 750 kilograms. That's wild. This has led experts to believe that these guys may have been a hyper carnivore, which means that they were feeding on some pretty tough prey. Other creatures that have outer protection like they do. Ammonites, they were able to chew through some pretty tough exteriors. In our number 7 spot today we have the Mausaurus. These guys are a creature that was once very real, but they are thankfully a relic of our past because they are absolutely horrifying. They are named after the Maori god Maui, who is said to have pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the sea floor, so anything named after him is of course going to be an absolutely ginormous beast. The neck of this creature measured around 49 feet long, which is the longest proportionate neck of any animal. The entire creature measured around 66 feet long, so it's clear that their neck counted for a very large portion of their body. But like, imagine a swimming dinosaur creature with a huge snake for a neck. That's kind of what these guys were like. These guys lived on Earth during the Cretaceous period, which is good news for us, but not so much for the creatures that lived at that time. Creatures would jump into the water to avoid a T-Rex only to find this guy waiting for them. Yeah. No thank you. In our number 6 spot today we have the Helicorprion. This animal existed somewhere around 250 million years ago and while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know it was actually a creature that is related more closely to chimeras which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal just scary and terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives. No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. No. 
Number five, glass sponges, not glass slippers. Don't let the name fool you. These sponges are anything but fragile. Forget centuries. These creatures can live for thousands of years, even in the 10,000s. But for a while, they were thought to have gone extinct. Joke's on us. Goes to show how much we know about the ocean, which, by the way, isn't a lot. It's like less than 30%. In 1987, a team of Canadian scientists discovered a cluster of living glass sponge reefs over 9,000 years old. So if they can live and thrive for so long, why are they called glass? Well, they get their name from their spicules, which are tiny, sharp structures made from silica, a kind of glass. They feed off of plankton and other small sources of food and can filter enough water in 60 seconds, get ready, to fill an Olympic-sized pool. They also don't look appetizing and mostly serve as homes to other kinds of fish and crustaceans. Though starfish tend to like to feed on them now and then, it's pretty sad. Coming in at our number four spot is one of my favorite things to eat, lobster. Or as a much more fun name, the Homerus Americanus. Sounds like gladiator. I am Homerus Americanus, are you not entertained? Scientists have discovered that through time, some lobsters can increase their fertility due to a certain enzyme called telomerase. This enzyme repairs the lost sections of DNA, making the aged cells revert back to being young again. Though this would seem to make these creatures immortal, the exact lifespan of these creatures is difficult to determine because of the regular molting of exoskeletons. Aside from that, they only have one major predator to fear, and that is me. If you like this video and you are new to our hive, make sure to like and subscribe. We love you for it, and uh, one day, hopefully, we'll all be able to hug you. I don't know. I hope so. Number three, bowhead whales. There must be something about the cold climate of the Arctic because it seems like some of the biggest creatures live there, including the bowhead whale, who, by the way, is not only massive, but can live for over two centuries. They are one of the most well-adapted creatures who live in the Arctic with an insulating layer of lubber over a foot and a half thick without humans being the hunters. Given that they are some of the biggest creatures, nothing can really threaten their existence. But beyond that, the reason they can live for so long is due to their unique genetic makeup that allows them to repair their own damaged DNA. They also age slower in general, similar to the tortoise we talked about, and they only reach sexual maturity around 25 to 30 years old. So even though time takes its sweet time killing them, humans don't, and they are under the endangered species list. Coming in at our number two spot is the Greenland shark. Known as the longest living vertebrate on Earth, this shark lives an average of 272 years old. They also don't reach sexual maturity until the age of 150 years old. Now, how can they live so long? Well, with their incredible resilience to cold water, darkness, and living at depths of 2200 meters, I'm guessing most of these sharks won't have much competition down there. This shark is actually from the prehistoric era, which is proven by an extra gill that it has on its body. So not only do these things live for crazy long periods of time, they were able to come out on top after the destruction of the dinosaurs. Man, these guys ain't playing. Number one, Tyratopsis dorni. Imagine being able to decide like when you feel like getting younger, you know? <laughs> Too old, I'm gonna go back a few years. Wow, when will we have that technology? Sounds impossible, but this specific kind of jellyfish can actually do this. When it reaches a certain age, it can begin converting its cells backwards in time. They aren't indestructible, they can still be gobbled up, but depending on how lucky they are, they could potentially live forever. The creature was first discovered in 1883 and has captured the curiosity of scientists ever since. After all, why wouldn't it? An animal that has figured out how to turn back the clock of time? Now that sounds super useful. These creatures are able to do this through a process called transdifferentiation. The cells begin to convert from one type to another, albeit very slowly. They aren't really aware they are doing it, since jellyfish don't really have brains. They simply survive by how their nerves respond to stimuli, kind of like when a doctor hits your knee with a hammer and you just kick something, it's involuntary. They have no idea how rare and how incredible they really are. Honorable mentions to tardigrades, the water bears, because they're really cute and weird, and they can also live forever. Number 10, the walking worm. Okay, this was my nickname back in high school. Nice, good to be back, this one sounds nice. Earthworm Jim, Gumby, I got them all. Just a walking, lanky worm dude. 
Meet the Hallucigenia fortis, named by Simon Conway Morris back in 1979. Conway Morris named it Hallucigenia fortis because of its bizarre and dreamlike quality. Sure, art's subjective, I guess, to each their own. There were over 109 specimens of these strange aquatic creatures, and they ranged in size from half a centimeter to three centimeters long. Now, number 10 on our list, okay, gotta start small, not too large, and since it was an invertebrate, it lacked a spine. Just like me, no spine, you know, just all worm. Just all air, like an inflatable person. Defining features of the walking worm, as its name suggests, were these tentacles that protruded out from the body. It had spikes that it maybe and possibly probably walked on. How terrifying is that? And in 2015, scientists realized where its head was. Yeah, its real head. We thought a fossilized stain was its head for like 35 years. And then in 2015, we found its real head. And it looks like it's grinning almost with two eyes. Dare I say worse than the stain? Let's stop looking. Number nine, the big fin squid. From the Magnapinidae family, the big fin squid, or as I like to call it, this ocean alien with shoulders and elbows, belongs to a group of rarely seen cephalopods with a distinctive morphology meaning that they're really weird looking and really rare. The first record of us catching and looking at this thing comes from 1907 in the Azores. But due to the damaged nature of the find, little information could be actually extracted. It just looked like a piece of wet crinoline pulled out of a lake. During the 80s, five specimens were found in the Atlantic and Pacific. So eventually the creature found a place amongst the books as its own species entering the Magnapinidae, or squids. So it's not actually a squid but like a third cousin. This thing looks like it crashed here on an asteroid, doesn't it? The arms are huge and held perpendicular to the body, creating the illusion of arms and elbows, giving it its trademark alien figure. Some of these things are longer than 10 meters too. That's like a school bus. These things are definitely living under the ice on Jupiter. I'm just gonna say it. I said it. Number eight, giant dragonfly. Dragonflies are awesome. I have a dragonfly tattoo. I had to check which arm, that's awesome. Welcome to being 28, I guess. Uh, but these sticky lads are old school, okay? Dragonflies are sweet. They were the first winged insects to ever evolve 300 million years ago. Modern dragonflies have wingspans of only two to five inches, but ancient giant dragonflies, again, as their name suggests, well, their wingspan was two to three feet. They're a lot bigger and scarier and stickier. I hope they never come back to this size. Again, like I mentioned in part one, it's that high, <gasps> it's that high oxygen level that does the body good. Yeah, the Paleozoic era had these beasts hovering around because, you know, the air was too good back then. Nearly all of their head is its eye, so you're f***ed in every angle, basically. The movie Dune, if you've seen this recently, great film. The ornithopters, they're engineered to fly like a dragonfly. This is based on real life science. Engineers in real life are studying dragonflies, their flight patterns right now with their wings. Just keep, keep them small and we're good. Study away, keep them small, please. Number seven, the frilled shark. Chlamydos lacus and genius, AKA the frilled shark, is the extinct species of shark that once swam our oceans. <laughs> Thank gosh. Well, actually kind of still does. Oh. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil, not just its age and time spent surfing the coast due to its primitive eel-like brown body. Its snake-like jaws, eight-foot body, and the way it moves under the water are all common in ancient serpents and water creatures. Yeah, this thing's a water dragon, basically. This thing's like an eel-serpent-shark hybrid. It swims the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, usually in deep, murky water. So am I just gonna like snorkel into one of these things any day now? Good thing is that these things are really hard to find. Like, really hard. Usually caught by accident in commercial fishing nets, usually at depths anywhere between 50 and 1,000 meters. So unless you're free diving at night and have a supersonic lung span, you should be okay. Number six, the gastric brooding frog. I'm a big fan of frogs, except for when they, you know, hatch out of their back. I don't like that. It's arguably the worst thing I've ever seen online, and I have read it, and had read it for years. These frogs would swallow its egg back in the day, and then they would hatch them out of their mouth. If you watched it backwards, you'd be like, no, stop. They all went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have somehow figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. So we may just see this fancy frog make a fancy comeback. Yeah, let's just hope these ones aren't born out of their backs. Do you want to see it? I feel like you want to see it. There it is. Enjoy. You asked for it. Thumbs up for this. You know, it's life, it's life, it's nature. Number five, giraffe moose. Oh, what, you think I'm kidding? Bam, giraffe moose. Tell me if that is anything else. This giraffe moose, actually named the Zebatherium, is an extinct genus of giraffe that ranged throughout Africa to the Indian subcontinent. It was the largest giraffe known and also possibly the largest ruminant of all time. Remains have been recovered from the Himalayan foothills dating around 1 million BC, and scholars agree that species came to be around 7 million years ago in the late Miocene and was 
likely gone by the early Pliocene. But, um, oopsies. How did it go extinct a million years ago if there's evidence of its existence up until 8,000 years ago, dummies? Some of the earliest indications were found in an ancient rock paintings in the Sahara and the central West India. Then, when archaeologists were tearing up the ancient Sumerian city-state of Quiche in 1920s, they find an elaborate copper rain ring created to fit onto the tongue of a chariot, and the artist had carefully recreated a unique animal down to the smallest details. And what can be seen is an awful like a Cibitherium, which can be thoroughly reconstructed from fossil remains. Unlike giraffes of today, Cibitheriums had short necks with short stocky legs, and at the time of their first discovery of the bones of the mammals in the 1800s, researchers, I wish I was joking, thought it might be the link between giraffes and elephants, and now I have to get that image out of my brain. And what better to follow up the moose giraffe than number four, desert rat kangaroo. That one isn't even a lazy nickname I thought of. These novelist at heart scientists really named this thing with the cadence of a hillbilly. Well, it jumps like a kangaroo, looks like a rat, and it's in the desert. That's a mighty fine name we got there right as is. To make up for the lack of ingenuity, the indigenous of the outback had a pretty fun name for it, Ulukunta. This small hopping marsupial from the desert regions of central Australia has a kind of crazy backstory. It was discovered in the early 1840s, and by discovered, I mean colonizers learned about it for the first time. The indigenous of the terrain had been using it as a food source for centuries, but then it vanishes for 90 years. The species was then rediscovered in 1931 by Hedley Finlayson, a one-eyed, one-handed chemist with a passion for Australian mammals. Imagine a little animal about the bulk of a rabbit, but built like a kangaroo with a long, spindly hind leg, tiny forelegs folded tight on its chest, and a tail half as long again as the body, but not much thicker than a lead pencil he had written. Now one of our only visual accounts, because that was the last one ever seen. There was a 2011 reported sighting of a desert rat kangaroo nest, but this yielded no usable DNA. Another animal I can't say, so I'm just gonna dub is the giant capybaras, coming in at number three. Josephio argiacea. I'm lucky if I managed that correctly. You'd also be able to be lucky to survive one of these things because they're literally giant killer hell rats. They complete opposite in every way to what we just covered in the last point. These inflated rodents resembled capybaras the size of cows, with an estimated average weight of one ton. And it's the largest rodent known to have lived, which was approximately four to two million years ago during the Pliocene to the early Pleiocene. Imagine a bunch of killer rats just roaming around, 10 feet long with another five feet of tail. They might have been herbivores, but their foot long incisors would have packed such a strong bite that I don't want to think about it. Some theories suggested that they used said teeth to fight over females for breeding rights, but other than that, they used them like shovels to find roots. The Pliocene era is around the same time that the last ice age ended. Changes in climactic conditions are believed to have contributed to the decline of the species, alongside competition from invasive species migrating from North America. For number two, we look at what I can only dub as cursed elephants. It's like a wizard came along, and since the elephants were talking crap about them, the wizard cursed them to have upside down mouths. Why are your tusks there, bro? Seriously. Today's elephants obviously have uh, less eyesore tusks, ones that come straight out of their jaws since they're supposed to be teeth, but their ugly cousin ancient relatives did not have the same arrangement, evidently. Around 20 million years ago, there lived a prehistoric creature named the Deotherium. It was, its name was accurately derived from the ancient Greek word for terrible beast, and the large prehistoric elephant survived until the early Pleidocene. Uh, precisely what the elephant used its bizarre tusks for isn't clear to scientists. One out of pocket throwaway idea is that the Deotherium used to use them to anchor itself to riverbanks while sleeping so its body could just float in deep water. Amazingly, isolated populations of Deotherium persisted into historical times until they either succumbed to change in climate conditions or were hunted into extinction by early Homo sapiens. Not any of our distant relatives like Neanderthals. They were hunted by us. That means these awful looking things existed at the same time as modern humans. Imagine seeing one of those at night, half asleep while trying to pee in a bush. Stuff of nightmares. Anyways, always the last but never the least, it's number one, the Tasmanian tiger, aka the thylacine. Can't tell if it's a cat or a dog just by looking at it, but they're pretty cute. As you can see, they're about the size of a coyote and they have a magnificent wide long snout, helping them be apex predators. In fact, they were the only marsupial apex predator that lived in modern times, and therefore they played a massive key role in the ecosystem. Naturally, that doesn't bode well with humans. European settlers of the 1800s get all mad and blame the TT for the death of their livestock. In reality, records of farm animal deaths in those times show that the culprits are feral dogs and human habitat mismanagement. You'd think if you invaded someone else's land and chose to live there, completely inept at cultivating it, you don't get to complain about the 
ecosystem around you. But instead, the Euro settlers hunted the Tasmanian tigers to the point of extinction. Eventually, all that remained were in zoos, and the last of the tigers named Benjamin died from negligent exposure in 1936 at the Bumera Zoo in Tasmania. Negligent exposure. This happened directly after the animal was granted protection status. Benjamin is also the only Tasmanian caught on film, as you can see in this colorized version. So, interesting news times. Two layers to it. The first is that the TT could still persist in the most remote parts of the island. In July of 2019, Australian authorities received a report of a footprint spotted by an unnamed individual on a walk up the Sleeping Beauty Mountain. The man, to quote, wasn't able to take a photo. However, when he got home, he Googled it and believes it was the Tasmanian Tigers. That same year, more credibly, a government plant biologist saw what they believed to be a Tasmanian Tiger 100 feet away from him in a remote area. Meanwhile, in 2018, three cyclists insisted they witnessed a TT crossing the road in front of them. These are just three of more than 1,200 alleged sightings reported between 1910 and 2019. Layer number two, almost 100 years after its extinction, the Tasmanian tiger may live once again in a different way, a sketchy Jurassic Park kind of way. Scientists want to resurrect the carnivorous marsupial by harnessing advances in genetics, ancient DNA retrieval, and artificial reproduction. The initiative is taking place at their thylacine integrated genetic restoration research lab and is headed by Professor Andrew Pass, who says that this technology offers a chance to correct extinction and could be applied in exceptional circumstances where cornerstone species have been lost. Number 10. Longisquama. Longisquama is a very crucial genus of extinct reptile. I feel like I already sound like David Attenborough, dude. The Longisquama in Cygnus from the middle to late Triassic formation. That was not bad. That was not bad. Come on. Longisquama means long scales. In Cygnus means small. The Longisquama in Cygnus is notable for a number of long structures that appear to grow from its skin. Little mohawk boys, you know? These things were rad looking. They were diepsids, which was a reptile subclass. A small group of climbing and gliding reptiles. Little jumper dudes. These guys were awesome. Little mohawk tree dudes. They lived in forests located on the supercontinent once called Pangaea. Its most notable feature is a double row of long scale like pins running along its back, forming six to eight pairs. It had one pair of scales for each of its pair of ribs, like knight's armor, little mini tectonic plates mixed with feathers on top, and we get Longisquamous scales. Could be rows of wolverine claws, could be rows of feathers or dragonfly-ish wings. Scientists still don't know. This little mohawk boy is sick though. Little flying dude. Those are definitely little dragonfly wings, I'm calling it. Number nine, Carnotaurus. Okay, Kyle and I, we had a different dinosaur animated movie growing up as kids, okay? Today you've got the little dinosaur that's cute, that's great animation. Back when we were younger, we had the scary dinosaur movie. Remember that one? Where none of them talked with the Carnotaurus guy as the villain. Yeah, that one didn't talk. It was just the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm pretty sure I walked out of that theater. Didn't say a peep. And this guy didn't have to, really. Look at him. The Carnotaurus was a unit. Yeah, they thankfully disappeared 69 million years ago. Nice. They were around the same size as a T Rex, coming in at about 29 feet long, but they were nicknamed meat eating bulls. So, yeah, that ought to tip you why they were the villains in said movie. They would run at about 25 miles an hour. They're one of the fastest and largest moving theropods to ever live. Its arms were smaller than that of a T-Rex, so we could roast them in some capacity, okay? We got them on some, you know, on something. But honestly, it didn't matter because this one had horns, hence the meat-eating bull alias. It was rediscovered in 1984 by Jose Bonaparte in Argentina. They've only discovered one skeleton of these things, so hopefully there weren't too many of these poking around. Yeah, Aina Linda took me to see this one. I'm pretty sure I walked out. It fucked me up good. The scary guy, he runs out so fast. God, he's so fast. Number eight, Plesiosaurus. Ah yes, the Plesiosaurus. A genus of extinct, very large marine reptile that lived during the early Jurassic period. It is known by nearly complete skeletons from the waters and rocks in England. It is known for its small head, long and slender neck, broad turtle-like body, short tail, and two pairs of large paddles for limbs, and is apparently the legendary, the one and only Loch Ness Monster. Cue the bagpipes. The first complete skeleton of a plesiosaurus was discovered by paleontologist and fossil hunter Mary Anning in Jurassic Age rocks December 1823. Plesiosaurus are moderate size compared to what it was swimming around them at the time, usually only about 5 meters in length, and about 500 pounds. They had the head like a big pit bull, and the teeth like a big pit bull. They fed mainly on clams and snails. Okay, 
This is like a medium scary now, all of a sudden. Number seven, the great auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow 30 inches long, which isn't too scary, but hear me out. It had tiny wings that would only be used to swim. They were only 13 centimeters long. Kind of cute, but again, hear me out. They were small and jarring to look at. I mean, if this thing was coming at me today, I'd certainly have a rough time. But thankfully for hungry sailors, the great auk was greatly defenseless. Yeah, oops, sorry, we got a little, little snacky. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most, if not all, these great auks were living and thriving. Yeah, Newfoundland looked like the iceberg and club penguin. It was just like, mm, stacked, just looking real good. Now the iceberg and club penguin is gone, as are these guys, so, you know, not a bad bit. Also, I'm broken inside, I miss Club Penguin, RIP. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman, hunted on LD Island, just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. Remember those jars of organs, those guys with the random jars of exotic bird pieces? They come in handy, apparently. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-built ox. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one. Number six. Horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs are marine water arthropods of the family Lemulidae. Despite their name, they are not actually anything like crabs or crustaceans. Then what are they, dude? They are technically chalicerates, most closely related to arachnids like spiders and scorpions. Awesome. Like, what are we looking at here? What, what is this thing? Fossil records for horseshoe crabs extend back as far as 480 million years ago. Nice, thank God. Wait a second, nope, they're still around. Ha! <laughs> These shelly dudes like to keep it shallow, however, in murky waters, mostly in Southeast Asia. Horseshoe crabs use hemocyanin to carry oxygen through their blood, which actually turns their blood blue due to the copper in said proteins. This feature is similar to what white blood cells do for us, and because of this, these guys are unfortunately blood harvested every year by us for medicine. Non-lethal, which involves collecting and bleeding the creature and then releasing them back into the sea. Yeah, I'd be way too scared to grab this thing. Are you kidding me? Like, I respect the animal kingdom, but like at a distance. And number five on the countdown is first in line for that calamari, the frilled shark. Like the goblin shark, the frilled shark is considered a living fossil status. This shark has barely ever evolved from the state in which it was first discovered, or ever. It has next to no surviving relatives either. The frilled shark gets its name from the frilly appearance of its gill slits. But don't be deceived by a cute name, its appearance is grisly and prehistoric. It has a visual element of an eel, but arguably also an alligator. Its long cylindrical body reaches is a length of nearly 7 feet and its fins are placed far back on its body. Frilled sharks are active predators who may lunge at potential prey, swallowing it whole even if it is quite large. They have been known to feed on fish, eels, and their favorites being squid and even other sharks. What's most strange, however, is how this creature breeds. Frilled sharks reproduce via internal fertilization and give live birth. However, they do not connect through a placenta like most mammals. Instead, their embryos live off of their own yolk sacs, and only after the juveniles are able to survive on their own does the mother give birth to her young. This is said to be the longest gestation period of any creature, taking up to three years. That essentially is like if a human somehow kept their baby inside of them until it was a toddler. Ugh. Finally, some light in the darkness. Quite literally, number four is the elusive glass octopus. You know the scene in American Beauty where that creepy kid next door is like romantically enamored by the visual of a plastic bag in the wind? Not gonna lie, that's kinda how I felt watching the footage of this almost ethereal being as it floated around in the dark depths. Now, unlike the plastic bag that little twit fawned over in the movie, this is worth going gaga over. Researchers from the Schmidt Ocean Institute released footage of an elusive glass octopus off the coast of the remote Phoenix Islands, located more than 3,200 miles northeast of Sydney, Australia. It was originally discovered during their 34-day Central Pacific expedition, where for 182 hours, they scanned the seafloor. During this scan, they found the beautiful glass octopus. The species gets its names from its almost trans translucent body with only its cylindrical eyes, optic nerves, and digestive tract appearing opaque. They can grow about 1.5 feet long and are estimated to live only 2 to 5 years. As you may remember from the goblin shark or the blobfish, deep sea animal development is shaped around the 
lack of sunlight and around water pressure. And glass octopus is no exception, living at an average of 3,000 feet deep. The glass octopus lives deep, hard to reach places, so there's much we don't know about this translucent and luminescent cephalopod. There have been only a few sightings and a couple remains found in animal stomachs. Personally, I could watch it swim around all day. But we have to move on. So number three is the barrel eye fish. Nothing I title this segment as can prepare you for the picture you're going to see. Averaging a water depth of 2100 feet, footage of this creature was caught on an ROV camera in the Monterey Submarine Canyon, the deepest submarine canyon of the Pacific Coast. This species has only been spotted and reported nine times, despite over 5600 deep dives being done in this fish's habitat. The barrel eye fish first appeared very small out in the blue distance, but I immediately knew what I was looking at. It couldn't be mistaken for anything else. This was said by Thomas Knowles, a senior aquarist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. But why was it so distinctive to him? Well, this bizarre fish has a translucent forehead and face, which actually looks through using a pair of bulbous green eyes that are inside its head. That's right, I'm saying the whole body is just normal opaque fish body, but its head, and ironically the back fin too, are entirely transparent. They can move their eyes to look forward, but they mainly look up in search for prey. Imagine we all had a layer of skin over our eyes, but it was see-through. Yeah, that's that thing's life. So you can see through this creature's entire musculatory and structural system, and more importantly, it can look back through it at you. Number two in the countdown has me happy photos get added in post. The red hand fish, which I swear I can't look at this thing without a little bit of a laugh. This guy's just too funny looking. Part of the angler fish family, these little fishies have little arm and hand like fins that they use to walk across the ocean floor rather than swim. Found in the Australian and Tasmanian waters, the little guys are thought to have a measly population of just 100 adults. It's a low reproductive rate and a low dispersal rate and it makes it a challenge for the species survival. Fragmentation of the population is also a challenge for reproductive species success as the only two reported colonies are in Tasmania and Australia and aren't near each other and don't interact as far as we know. Growing to about 15 centimeters long, its skin has scales reminiscent of teeth and can also come in colorations such as spotted or pink. To help attract their prey, which are other small fish, they have a fluffy lure on their forehead. Like other angler fish, they're ambush predators, which means they prefer to sit and wait amongst seaweed, sponges, coral, etc. for their prey to swim past before they strike. Recent government funding will help build resilience against threats to the wild red handfish populations. Either way, this is one fish you'll always catch red handed. Huh? Yeah? All right, all right. Finally, number one is one silly freaky dude with a weird name, the black swallower. This is our deepest sea buddy discussed so far. Surviving at a depth of 10,000 feet, which is 30 times the length of a football field, this fish is a shocking only nine inches. But this fish embodies the message that size doesn't matter. Thanks to a balloon-like stomach, large mouth and jutting lower jaw, it can swallow other fish and ocean life whole. Similar to how snakes can swallow a whole deer, it can consume oceanic life up to twice its length and 10 times its weight. Its hooked inward pointing teeth retract to make room for the prey and then interlock to keep it inside. But gluttony is a sin and if they take on too much fish or they simply just gorge too much, their meal can sit in their expandable stomach decomposing and releasing gases and then it becomes a race between those gases and digestion. Sometimes luck isn't on their sides and the gas in their stomach inflates to the point of buoyancy and carries the fish upward thousands of feet into the low pressure water zone, which is an uninhabitable space for a high pressure creature, resulting in their demise. Despite the risk of floating themselves up to death, their eat first, ask questions later strategy is clearly working out for the species. Black swallowers are very abundant in the temperate and tropical Atlantic as well as the Gulf of Mexico. Remember that the next time you hit the beaches on a Mexican getaway trip. Starting us off at our number 10 spot, we have hydras. No, not the evil villains from the Marvel Universe. I'm talking about these small water-based creatures found in the fresh waters of Europe, Asia, and the Americas. There are between 20 to 30 different species of hydra, and they are one of the 900 species belonging to the phylum Cindario, which are radially symmetrical invertebrates with tentacles. But the really cool part about these underwater creatures is that they are basically immortal. Studies show that these creatures do not show any signs of deterioration with age. They are able to continuously divide and regenerate new body cells and can basically keep themselves young forever. Remember that song Forever Young by Alphaville? It actually might be just about hydras, I think. Number nine, clams. Unless their lives are cut short by the yearly clam bake with your aunts and uncles, clams can actually live an absurdly long time for being 
that small. Some have even been found to be over a century old. Now to be fair, humans are starting to stretch that boundary too. We're trying our best. But considering how often clams are a food source, it's surprising. Like trees, clamshells also have rings on them, if you look carefully, that track how long they've been alive, which is how scientists can tell how long they've lived. Therefore, the bigger they are, the longer they've lived. They can weigh up to several hundred pounds and be as large as a yard across. The oldest clam ever found was named Ming Ming, and though she was only the size of an average human palm, she was about 570 years old, which is like, what? Does size matter? At our number eight spot, we have the rough eye rockfish. Pretty crazy name, right? Well, they get the name because of the spines that go along the bottom of their eyes. Kind of a rude name when you think about it. But these bright and intensely colored fish can be found in the Pacific Ocean, ranging from the northern part of Japan and Bering Sea, all the way to the North American coast down to California. Odds are, you won't get a chance to see any of these creatures unless you do a deep, deep dive because they live and spend most of their time at around 170 to 660 meters below the ocean surface. That's 560 to 2200 feet deep. These fish have been known to live over the age of 205 years old and mature much later on in their life. So that means they get to live most of their life looking young, fresh, happy, full of life with all their hopes and dreams ahead of them. <laughs> uh, must be nice. I mean, honestly, I can kind of do that too. If I ever do a video with my beard shaved off, you will see a Dewey that looks like he is 12. <laughs> Number seven, the Aldebaran giant tortoise. The oldest Aldebaran giant tortoise known to man passed away in 2007, and she was 255 years old, superseding her first owner, Robert Clive, who died at the age of 49 in 1774. Robert Clive was the first British governor in the Bengal presidency and was given Adwaita as a pet. It is not uncommon for Aldebar tortoises to live through centuries, and some even suggest that there have been ones twice as old as Azueta who have existed. They only reach maturity at 30 years old, so they age as slowly as they move, it seems. They also can go long periods without food and aren't picky eaters. They can eat almost anything from vegetation to dead carcasses to even feces. Ugh. With their ability to thrive on both land and water, on top of having a very hard shell to protect them from predators, this species is the poster child for the phrase, slow and steady wins the race. At our number six spot, we have the tree weta, also known as zombie bugs, or also, also known as Dewey's worst nightmare. These bugs are ridiculously resilient to freezing and have special proteins within their bodies that prevent freezing from ever actually occurring. Although their hearts and brains are not as resilient to freezing, they can die when being completely frozen. But guess what? When they thaw out, they can come completely back to life like the disgusting zombie-like creatures they are and scare Dewey back into his protective bunker away from every single scary bug on the planet. I've mentioned it before, Dewey doesn't do bugs. But you know what Dewey really doesn't do? Zombie bugs! Number five, Arthoplura. These creepy crawlies translate to jointed ribs. That's what their name means, jointed ribs. That's lovely, there we go. Arthoplura were these gigantic millipedes. Yeah, they would grow up to six feet long. Sorry, Jen, I forgot about these ones. These are kind of bugs. It was the largest known invertebrate ever. It ruled all over the arthropods, so any other spider, insect, crustacean, you name it, nothing compared to this horror. Nothing compares to you, six foot millipede, yuck. They roam the land during the Paleozoic period. They would crawl around at much higher speeds than today's millipedes, which is still so fast, way too fast. And they ate any decomposing organic matter. So no, they wouldn't gobble you up if you went back in time. The reason all these monster bugs got so large, by the way, was because 300 million years ago, oxygen made up 30% of the air, whereas now we're only sucking in, <gasps> we're only sucking in 21%. Yeah, we got that dirty hand-me-down air. But also, we have smaller bugs, so I'm not complaining too hard. Number four, Epicion. Much more than just a dog, these extinct canines were known as bone-crushing dogs. Awesome, let's not get these as pets, I guess. They would come in at around five feet long, greatly resembling a grizzly bear, and their massive head would come in handy during hunts, because it had the you know head size of a lion, and its jaw certainly played the part as well. No problem hunting, very fast. Lions, tigers, and bears all rolled up into one furry 300-pound sack of holy shit. It was made to crush, literally. Its fourth premolar was enlarged, just like some hyenas, just like bears. This thing too lived in what's now North America. They went extinct about six million years ago, which is pretty recent considering the other 
scary fossils on this list. Could you imagine camping and all of a sudden this thing comes in? Sorry, runs in or sprints in? I don't know, I'm out of here. Number three, Thylacosmolus. Sounds like a Harry Potter spell, I love it. Marsupials millions of years ago, they were a little bit weirder than our marsupials today, although they're still odd. They have the weird, scary face. Thylacosmolus, first of all, way better name than opossum. We should have kept that name, if anything. These guys back then looked like saber-toothed tigers, but it's really just a cousin to marsupials today. Its name translates to terrible pouch knife, awesome nickname, and it used to live in what's now South America. Albert Riggs discovered the remains of such a beast in the 1920s, but only recently we have now figured out it wasn't related to a cat. Although, looking at it, you're like, eh, I don't know, it looks a little similar. It's Teeth are intimidating, don't get me wrong, but this was just a big ass marsupial. And it's an A possum. Or an O possum. Or B possum. I don't know. I've lost count. Number two, there is no Saurus. There is no, there is no Saurus. Not anymore, thankfully. No, they've been dead for 75 million years. For sure gone. We love that. Here we go. There's no, there is no Saurus anymore. That sounds weird to say. They were also known in history as the Reaping Lizard, and it was first discovered in 1948. And these guys could grow up to 10 meters long, and they weighed about five tons. So yeah, like the lizard from Spider-Man. You're pretty much f***ed if you run into these. But the feature that stands out the most on this long neck raptor looking dinosaur is its massive claws. This thing's got baseball mitts for hands. It's like Freddy Krueger. These hands are way too big for that body. It's like a sports fan just ready to catch a foul ball. This is where the Greeks got the name from. There is a means to reap or to cut off. This was the Freddy Krueger of animals. And thankfully, its choice of meals was always a salad. No, it didn't shred up any animals unless it had to in self-defense. So leave this guy alone. The first fossil was discovered in the late 1940s from a Soviet Mongolian fossil expedition. And they found the claws first. And for 10 years, they had no idea what this belonged to. Just terrified people in a lab for 10 years straight. It wasn't until the early 50s until they found more bones. And then eventually all the pieces of the puzzle started to fit and they realized uh, it wasn't a turtle. Yeah, that was their first guess, just a big old turtle. Do you imagine that in the water? No fucking way. And finally, number one, Megalodon. Yeah, speaking of water and holy sh yeah, this thing was very real. Louis Agassiz first discovered the Megalodon shark back in 1843. Wasn't alive though, but it's still scary. He was a Swiss born American naturalist and geologist. He discovered some amazing details about glacier activity and extinct fish. He is brilliant in history. But one of those extinct fish just happened to be the tooth shark, AKA the Megalodon. It lived everywhere in the world, but Antarctica, really. This thing ruled our planet. It favored warm oceans, but similar to a great white, it generates heat when it moves, so it can survive most places. Yeah. I'm not great for us, it's swimming in the water. The largest recorded megalodon came in at 59 feet, about the same length as a bowling alley. So if this thing were alive today, there's no chance Jason Statham could take it. No, it's gonna take at least three Jason Stathams, at least. Its seven foot wide jaws had plenty of trunk space for a swimmer, and its five rows of razor sharp teeth ensured said swimmer didn't get out. So I'm glad they're all dead. In a nice way, I don't know, it sounds kind of horrible to say. I want to start off strong, you know, real invigorating animal. Something you haven't heard of, and what better than whatever this is. Here is what we know about it. So, among all the carnivorous mammals that have ever lived, the Androsaurus might have been the largest. Uh, it eats meat, it lives in the Inner Mongolia region of China around 56 to 33.9 million years ago. Well, it's vaguely related to present day hippos and aquatic mammals such as whales and manatees. Yeah, I think that's about it. Honestly, we know next to nothing about the Androsaurus. A guy named Roy Chapman Andrews, who became the director of the American Museum of natural history and was an explorer, found a foot and a skull belonging to this creature but nothing else. And no other fossils have ever come to light before or after. Thus it's named after him as the finder. Still, based on related animals, the Androsaurus seemed to be about the size of a rhino and took down prey with massive jaws, acting more like an enormous wolf than a cat. Hopefully more found fossils will fill in what we know about these 45 million year old enigmas, but if we've only found a foot and a skull, the future's looking pretty dim for Andrew. At least he gets to live on in the video game Ark Survival Evolved. And hey, if you don't want your future looking dim like dinos, instead as bright as the asteroid that hit them, be sure to subscribe to The Hive for more of Bumblebee's regularly posted videos. This one makes me happy. I don't have to see the pictures, but you do. Number 9 is the Koala Lemur. Well crap guys, looks like we found Gonzo's genetic lineage because what the hell is this thing? I literally hate every single photo I've seen of the Koala Lemurs who are an extinct genus, thank god 
honestly, that belong to the family of the Megalopedia. They once inhabited the island of Madagascar, but died out 500 years ago due to habitat fragmentation and deforestation. The koala lemur earned its nickname from the cranial and dental similarities to the Australian koala, which eats exclusively eucalyptus leaves. But since the two species are not closely related in the slightest, these anatomical similarities are likely a result of convergent evolution, perhaps adaptions for leaf eating diets. I don't know. Speaking of convergent evolution, ideally that's also the explanation as to why this whack job animal has high anatomical similarities to the snub nosed monkey, normal, and horses. These big B words to make a matter of its appearance somehow dramatically worse were literally the weight and sometimes the size of an adult person, averaging 5 foot 3 feet and approximately 187 pounds. Rest assured though, they were only one of the 17 giant lemur species on Madagascar. While there's still many lemur species on the island today, more than 100, the big boy ones died out between 500 and 2000 years ago. There's been a lot of fascinating news of these guys recently, so let's cover dire wolves for number 8. Their bones are commonly found in the La Bria tar pits of West Hollywood, but these bad boys, like their feline counterparts, the saber toothed tiger, ran the show in North America long before the Ice Age or running full speed into a tar pit wiped them out. So, this wolf species is about the same length as the modern gray wolf, but it weighed a little bit more, as much as 175 pounds. Think of how there are normal German shepherds, and they're already pretty big animals, but then there are king German shepherds, which are like the cap lock version of the original dog. Both have strong jaws, but only one's is so strong it can sever a human arm from the body. So, it's that, but a billion years ago, feral and bigger. Nonetheless, they went extinct about actually 10,000 years ago, and while their smaller cousins, thankfully, are still around, having made a comeback in recent years thanks to the reintroduction programs like Yellowstone National Parks, studies emerging just this week are revealing the recent findings that saber-toothed cats and dire wolves appear to have suffered major bone and joint disease towards the end of their existence. A discovery that may indicate these creatures were forced to breed with their litter mates as they went extinct. For the dire wolf, 2.6% of their femurs and 4.5% of their shoulders had defects towards the end of their species. Nothing says relaxing evening at the park like number 7. Instead of feeding them some breadcrumbs, you're running away from them. Terror birds. After the dinosaurs died, someone had to fill in their big shoes, and from the dust and the darkness emerged the one animal that would tell all others, hold my beer. For much of the Cenozoic era, terror birds dominated South America and hunted for sport, running upwards of 60 miles per hour and using its face as a literal hatchet against other animals, until they went extinct themselves around 2 million years ago. Though numerous different breeds of the species have been discovered, the largest of this flightless bird stood at 10 feet tall and weighed more than a thousand pounds. Its enormous skull, one of the largest known skulls for terror birds, and as a matter of fact, the largest known bird skull, period, to quote, that said, some scientists have suggest terror birds were more bark than bite despite that, and they weren't predators at all, but rather herbivores. Don't feel peace at that though, like mentioned, it means when they did hunt, it was for sport, not food, and that's a different kind of crazy. Paleontologist Louis Schiap feeds the nightmare machine by casually mentioning an interview, I mean, we know that a little parrot, a cockatoo, can take your finger off, Chiap told The Wire, but imagine what a bird like that could have done, the damage it could have done with just a strike of this massive skull and beak. Yeehaw! Up next is the Syrian wild ass, number 6. This little kick ass guy was one of the smallest equine there ever was, and I guess its tiny stature didn't allow room for any emotion that wasn't spite, because these guys refused to be domesticated. By the way, scientists like saying that they couldn't be, but that really means a species just wanted nothing to do with humans. So, the Syrian wildy lived in the desert, semi-deserts, dry grasslands, and mountain steppes. Native to West Asia, they were also found in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. Its color changed with the seasons, turning a tawny olive color in the summer months, and a pale sandy yellow in the winter. Between its beautiful coat and remarkable face, these animals were compared to a thoroughbred horse for aesthetic and strength. There's actually a lot of stories about them too. Xiophon of Athens mentions Syrian wildies in his Anabasis of 370 BCE. He reports that they were the most common of animals encountered in Syria and that horsemen would occasionally chase them for fun, since the wildies could easily outrun the horses. Xiophon then said it was almost like a game for them, as they would only run a short distance ahead of the horses before stopping, waiting for the horses to get closer, and then running ahead again. He also said that the little wildie guys were impossible to catch without careful planning first, and the meat tasted like a more tender version of venison. It's believed that they may be the wild ass that Ishmael was prophesized to be in Genesis in the Old Testament, and there are also references to the animal that appear in the Old Testament books of 
Job Psalms, Jeremiah, and the Deutra canonical book of Siraj. They even get a Quran shout out. European travelers in the Middle East during the 15th and 16th centuries reported seeing large herds, but tragically, their numbers began to drop during the 18th and 19th centuries due to overhunting and then a regional upheaval of World War I. The last known spoiled specimen was fatally popped in 1927 in Jordan, and the last captive specimen died the same year in Vienna. Number five, the giant sloth. If all of your information about prehistoric giant ground sloths was gathered from watching the animated Ice Age movies, buckle up. For starters, some of these guys were as big as elephants and one of the biggest land mammals. Other versions were as big as oxen or bears. So these suckers were pretty beefy, which I'm sure Sid the Sloth would be happy to hear. They also mostly walked on all fours, although they probably did stand on their hind legs to reach the top of trees and possibly as a defensive tactic. Ice Age was somewhat correct about how they were a little odd. For example, they probably did actually waddle thanks to their giant feet. They also oddly had teeth on the sides of their mouths used for crushing plants. The giant ground sloths are unsurprisingly related to our modern day sloths, but also to anteaters and armadillos. They were mainly South American mammals, but had different versions all over the Americas from 35 million to 11,000 years ago, until around the time of the Ice Age. Number four, Gigantopithecus. Put your hands together if you wanna clap as I take you through this monkey rap. DK, Donkey Kong, you know what I'm saying? Ah, great game. Although I never understood why his name is Donkey Kong. I digress. Why am I bringing up one of Nintendo's beloved mascots? Well, that's because I'm talking giant ape, baby. That's right. Gigantopithecus was a large ape that lived in Southeast Asia, some parts of China, and Vietnam. Coming in at a whopping 660 pounds, DK here would need to eat a lot of plants, which, judging by teeth and molars and other great apes, suggests he was a herbivore. At least I hope. I'm just gonna keep calling him DK because otherwise I'll be here all day with my dyslexia, but DK is most closely related to orangutans. However, 100,000 years ago, after some severe climate changes and food shortages, DK was no more. And it was game over. Number three, Terror Bird. Such a fitting name. This carnivorous bird became the top predator in South America after the dinosaurs went bye-bye. This bird had about 25 different species, ranging from one to three meters or 10 feet in height. That's a big bird. Some species could have been scavengers, but others, Oh, they were definitely apex predators. Some had big, strong, stout legs that were probably good for kicking prey or even crushing bones with big curved claws or talons for stabby behavior. They had big skulls with bones that were fused together, unlike a lot of birds, which was probably useful for pecking things into the afterlife with their massive sharp beaks that were also likely useful for getting big, nasty, fleshy bites. Their closest living relatives in South America today take out their prey by picking it up and slamming it into the ground over and over and over and over again. So imagine that, but from a giant 10 foot angry ostrich with a giant beak. So yeah, terror bird, it's a good name. Number two, giant beaver. Yeah, my Aunt Flo used to have a bear-sized beaver. Too bad it ran away. Okay, all jokes aside, giant beavers, also known as casteroids. That's a strange name. First discovered in the very busy and important state of Ohio back in 1837, these fossils pop up anywhere from Toronto all the way down to Florida. Hmm. Getting as large as seven feet long and just shy of 300 pounds. This is a beaver whose dam you don't want to break. Despite how awesome the giant beavers were, they are now extinct. And despite the Hudson Bay companies or the dismay of French Canadian fur trappers, the beaver went extinct thousands of years ago. Today we are unsure what made them go extinct. Today we are unsure what made them go extinct. Some suggest hunting, uh, but we're not even sure if they existed along early humans. All I know is that a tail on that bad boy would be very dangerous. Seriously, people don't think the beavers are dangerous, but you gotta be careful around them. And I salute the beaver as it is Canada's national animal after all. Number one, Andrew Sarkis. And here we are, Andrew's ancient relative, the Andrew Sarkis. The name Andrew Sarkis was given as a dedication to Roy Chapman Andrews, who I share a last name with, so maybe I'm related too. Who can say? Andrews, such a unique name, isn't it? Which is fitting, because this bad boy right here was unique. Its massive three-foot skull was very similar to a wolf skull, but its jaw and tooth structure made it more like a mesonicket, which are related to horses and deers, but also relatives to whales and hippos. 
It was a giant hoofed carnivore, like a mix between a pig and a wolf, but massive. It probably ate literally anything it could get its jaws around. It could have been anything from tinier mammals to plants and roots to giant herbivores related to rhinos. If I ran into a huge hoofed pig wolf capable of taking down rhinos, I'd just lay down and give up. Luckily, it lived 45 to 35 million years ago in Asia, specifically the area around and near modern day Mongolia. And Andrew Sarkis did not adapt well to the changing times and didn't last as long as other ancient creatures on this list. Just like Andrew, we're still trying to figure out exactly what kind of animal Andrew Sarkis was. Starting off at number 10 is the Japanese spider crab. This isn't the type of crab you'll see staring back at you from the fish counter of a metro. These guys usually sit around 1,000 feet deep below the waterline. Growing up to 15 inches wide, the spider crab can weigh an average of 44 pounds. To give some perspective, the average crab usually weighs one third of a pound. Spider crabs also earn their name as unlike the average crab, their legs are extremely long, wide, and spindly. Suspending the body up the way a daddy long leg spider would kind of look. Native to the Pacific Ocean, it's one of the largest known anthropods, a group of invertebrate animals that includes lobsters, spiders, and insects. No need to be scared, however, these guys are known as gentle giants that scavenge dead animals and plants. They're also part of the decorator crab group, who like to adorn their shells with sponges and other corals. Crab fashion, that's kinda nice. Next up is meme material, number nine, the blobfish. The winner of 2013's Ugliest Animal Award, the blobfish is gelatinous, with no bones and and pretty much no muscle either. Now, it resides at 3,000 feet deep, where it looks a lot less out of place as that deep, the water pressure hits about 120 times that of surface level. The intense level of water pressure would be hard to endure without being a gelatinous husk, so it appears this creature had just adapted. When you see images or drawings of the blobfish and what it looks like in the correct water pressure, its body actually formulates together and looks like a close to normal everyday fish. The blobfish, unlike many other fish, doesn't have the air sac in its gut that aids in buoyancy. If a fish with one is removed from its habitat, sometimes the air sac escapes through the fish's mouth and brings its organs and insides out with it, which is a nasty way to go. Blobfish, however, doesn't have an air sac and relies on the water pressure to be its structural support and buoyancy, thus regaining its shape and water pressure. Go blobfish! Take this as a lesson in body shaming. Being different isn't bad. Sometimes it means you aren't in the right environment and you need a little support. Number eight on the countdown, however, gets no slack. It's an ugly and evil undersea Pinocchio, the goblin shark. Known for being a living fossil, the goblin shark has swum in the oceans of the world for the last 125 million years, when primitive mammals were just starting to be recorded. Similar to the blobfish, it has a pale pinkish color due to translucent skin, the common result of living 4,300 feet deep. But these terrifying creatures have been seen as high as 130 feet deep late at night. It's earned its goblin title, with 53 long fangs protruding from the upper jaw and 62 from the bottom, its bulging jaw protrudes from its face, no longer than the ridiculous long forehead nose thing. To make matters worse, this animal slingshots just its jaw forward from its face to hunt. For perspective, if a human were capable of doing that, we could eat something that was seven feet away from us. It's too deep for a goblin shark to pose any threats to humans, and God please, let's keep it that way. Oh, and we're back to bugs. Number seven, the giant isopod. My bug phobia people from point 10 may start hating me because this crustacean resembles a jumbo potato bug. Living on the ocean floor, it's in the family of shrimps and crabs, but actually the roly-poly potato bugs that hang out in your gardens as well. Now the deep sea version is a little bigger, growing as big and sometimes bigger than 16 inches with a whopping 14 legs. Research requires extensive submersible to observe them over long times, and there aren't many people formulating research around them, so there's still a lot of about these creatures we don't know much about, such as their mating, birthing, and internal functions. Why is it so expensive to research? The giant isopod lives in an extreme habitat, the deep sea. They live an average of 1,600 feet or lower, where there's less than one millionth of the sunlight found on the surface of the water, a level of perceivable darkness you and I will never see. Speaking of unseemly creatures of dark depths, the giant squid of folklore is number six on the countdown. Okay, if you have heard about this, it was 
likely in a fictional movie or a novel depiction, so I'm saying that doesn't count because many people don't know that the giant squid is a real creature. In Japan, on April 25th of 2022, hundreds of people got that reality check when a still living giant squid washed up on the shores of a beach. Normally, a shore wash up occurs after they've passed and their bodies are rocked by water currents. It was abnormal that a living one washed up and this big guy was packed up and sent for rehabilitation at a Japanese aquarium where he remains today. In the case of the 2022 Jumbo, the squid was 9.8 feet long. That's actually pretty small. The average giant squid is 50 plus feet in length. Their eyes, which are one foot in diameter, are the largest found on any living creature, and its enormous tentacles are allowed to grab prey from even 30 feet away. But there is always a bigger fish. While these squids don't have many predators due to the effects of giantism having the upper hand, their beaks or tentacle remnants have been found in the stomachs of sperm whales. That's one big batch of calamari. In our number five spot today, we have the helicoprion. Okay, listen, there are many problems with our modern world. We could sit here all day talking about them. We could even go into next week, there are so many. But here's the thing we need to realize. Things could be so much worse, and by worse, I mean that this creature could still exist. This animal existed somewhere around 250 million years ago, and while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know that it was actually a creature that is related more closely to chimeras, which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal so scary and just terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives. No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. Yeah, no thanks. In our number four spot today, we have the Mosasaurus. During the Cretaceous period, which spanned about 145.5 to 65.5 million years ago, there was this genus of reptiles called Mosasaurus. These guys were absolutely huge aquatic reptiles that roamed throughout the waterways here on Earth. Because of their size, they became apex predators during this time, and they have been estimated to have grown to about 56 feet. At the time of their existence, it isn't exactly likely that they would have encountered any sharks that are alarmingly large like the Megalodon was, but I mean the Cretaceous period certainly had some other massive creatures that put up some pretty stiff competition. This is of course, like I mentioned, an entire genus, so there are definitely some less threatening species in the mix, but there are some in there who would have given the Meg a run for their money should they have existed at the same time. In our number three spot today, we have the Leviathan. If we were to look at our ocean today, we of course would see sharks as one of the top predators that exist. I mean, some sharks Sharks are huge, and they certainly know how to hunt, but they aren't the only scary creatures roaming the oceans. Sometimes, killer whales make such a grand appearance that they even scare off some of the most terrifying sharks and make them flee for incredible distances. This is something that was also seen many, many, many years ago, I mean millions of years ago, during the time of the Megalodon, and that is thanks to this gigantic creature known as the Leviathan. If you are unfamiliar, this is a now extinct genus of macroraptorial sperm whale. It is believed that they could weigh around 100,000 pounds and reach up to 57 feet in length. And it's thought that their size is what helped repel other predators while also helping them become the predator themselves. The Leviathan also had enormous teeth, teeth that reached over a foot in length, which is what gave them the title of largest bite of any tetrapod. In our number two spot today, we have the Chronosaurus. This Cretaceous marine reptile is one that had an elongated head, a short neck, and a stiff body that was propelled by not just one, but two sets of fins that helped it get through the water and through strong currents in order to capture whatever prey it was after. These guys were somewhere around 30 to 40 feet in length, and they had many, many long, sharp conical teeth, with some of them being enlarged to be fangs. So yeah, I mean, what more could you want from a terrifying sea creature? Along with the fossils found of these guys, experts have been able to determine some of the stuff they ate, and it includes turtles, as well as other pliosaurs, which these guys are a part of that genus, meaning they basically ate their own family. In our number one spot today, we have the Mausaurus. These guys are a creature that was once very real, but thankfully are a relic of our past because they are absolutely horrifying. They are named after the Maori god.
god Maui, who is said to have pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the sea floor, so anything named after him is of course going to be an absolute ginormous beast. The neck of this creature measured around 49 feet long, which is the longest proportionate neck of any animal. The entire creature is measured around 66 feet, so it is clear that their neck counted for quite a large portion of their body. But like, imagine a swimming dinosaur creature with a huge snake for a neck. That's kind of what these guys were like. These guys lived on Earth during the Cretaceous period, which is good news for us, but not so much for the creatures that lived at the time. Creatures would jump into the water to avoid a T-Rex, only to find this guy waiting for them. Yeah. Mm -mm. No thanks. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and I will see you. Number 10, cockroaches. Nice. Hope you're eating a snack right off the bat. I've been playing a lot of Fallout 4 recently. Cockroaches are going to outlive all of us. Apparently, you see it in movies, you see it in comic books, games. These little guys can survive anything, and they're really gross to look at, and they're fast. They can survive a literal apocalypse, however that may look. There are over 4,000 species of cockroaches, believe it or not, and they can withstand high levels of radiation, and they're on track right now to outlast all of our insecticides. This is so scary, I'm alarmed while I'm doing this. While these creepy crawlies are exposed to toxins, they quickly evolve right there in front of our very eyes. They can evolve on the spot. We're literally making them stronger right now. Although cockroaches will live two years at most, females give birth to around 300 offspring at a time. I just got goosebumps, that's horrible. I'm not a fan of bugs, but, well, we're at number 10, so it's gonna get worse. Number nine, mosquitoes. These little blood suckers have been around since the age of dinos. They're all over you when you're outside, when you're camping, all of a sudden you're scratching all weekend and it's not fun. They're annoying, but when it comes to the Amazon rainforest, mosquitoes there are much worse than you could ever imagine. Mosquitoes are one of the most dangerous because, well, for starters, they can fly. That ought to be pretty helpful. And you don't see them coming, and by the time you do, it's far too late, that's it. If you travel to parts of the Amazon rainforest and you don't have yellow fever vaccinations or extremely strong mosquito repellent, well, you're gonna have a very bad time, my friend. These suckers are literally just clouds of malaria just waiting for you to walk into. Even cottages, I can't do it. I have to wear the net the costume around my head the whole time. I feel like a knight when I wear one of those, but you know what, I feel safe. Number eight, box jellyfish. Let's go under the sea for a hot minute. We talked about the blue ring octopus on here before, so, you know, what other haunting discovery lurks below the waves? Box jellyfish, of course, also not wise to touch, so don't think about it. But Australian box jellyfish specifically, they have plenty of venom. They're super deadly, and it doesn't help that they're practically transparent in the ocean. They look like little bags of skin going by. I don't know why I said bags of skin. That's an odd thing to say. You won't see them coming at all. They're just clear blobs that float towards you. And its tentacles can sting you with its millions of nematocysts. Also, peeing on your leg won't solve this problem. It's not gonna work this time, pal, all right? Zip up, not a good idea. Australian box jellyfish carries around toxins that cause extreme pain, paralysis, delirium, cardiac arrest, and or even death all within five minutes or less. You won't even have time to get your goggles off and ask for help. You'll be done, just like that. One jellyfish has enough venom to kill 60 adults. Yikes, I'm never swimming again in the ocean. Specifically, not with 59 other adults, that's for sure. That's a bad setup. Number seven, black caiman. If you aren't a fan of alligators or things with a lot of teeth, you may wanna skip to the next one. Black caiman is the largest family member in the Alligatoridae crew. Alligatoridae crew, Alligatoridae, that sounds like a spell. Alligatoridae, turn you into a Alligatoridae. These super alligators live in calm, slow moving rivers, places you really wouldn't expect, you know, a dinosaur to jump out at you all of a sudden. Just like dangerous river snakes, these black caiman will take it slow and wait for their prey to have a sip of water. And then the largest predator in the Amazon will grab its lunch in a second and then quickly return to the water. You won't even see them, they'll just grab it and go. Maybe they'll do that twisty thing, that's terrifying. Birds, reptiles, mammals, this thing can and will eat everything. Between 2008 and October 2013 alone, there were 43 black caiman attacks on people and a handful of these were sadly fatal. Number six, the green anaconda. Remember the movie Anaconda with Ice Cube in it? That was a great time, that was cool. This movie came out 25 years ago and I still remember it 
to this day. It made me extremely afraid of snakes and the water and also Ice Cube. I thought every snake was like a 30 foot long snake after this, it was not a good time. But just how accurate was that film? Although the green anaconda is a non-venomous snake, the boa constrictor is still one of the most feared. Green anacondas specifically live in calm marshes or slow streams. Again, they wait until their large prey gets thirsty, and then once they come to the water, the anaconda surfaces and suffocates its lunch. Yeah, anacondas hunt prey that's larger than us humans, so if they wanted to, they could for sure eat us. There's only no evidence of it happening because humans rarely interact with them in the first place which is a pretty funny statistic, I guess. So anacondas don't know that they can eat us yet. So let's stay away just for, just for good measure. Green anacondas can reach lengths of up to 30 feet long. So plenty of space for you and yours. In our number five spot today, we have the Megalodon. Is any terrifying prehistoric sea creatures list truly complete without an appearance from the Meg? Megalodons are one of the largest sharks to have ever existed. They were huge. They were terrifying, they were apex predators, and they are the creatures that inspired the tales of Jaws, or the Meg. The teeth on these sharks are so large that they are three times larger than the teeth of a modern great white shark. With teeth that size, you can only imagine how large this shark would have been. It's pretty tough to figure out exactly why the Megalodon died out. I mean, they were one of the largest, scariest creatures who shouldn't have had any trouble finding food. But that might not be the case. Some believe it was the cooling water, others believe it was the competition for food. Whatever the case in the end, while the Megalodon is an incredible creature in history, I think we can probably all breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't currently swimming around our oceans. Or are they? In our number four spot today, we have Cretoxyrena. Measuring about seven meters long, these creatures aren't necessarily the largest on this list full of prehistoric giants, but that does not mean it is any less terrifying. Fossil evidence has shown us that these creatures were ready to attack just about anything and everything that ended up in front of them. It could be a four meter long fish, a marine reptile like a mosasaur, or even a large turtle, it doesn't matter. The key to what made these guys so incredibly ferocious is their special teeth. Their teeth adapted to have a much thicker enamel, which meant that they were exceptionally resilient. This is perfect when you're trying to cut through shells and bones. These teeth are actually what landed these guys with the nickname of the Jinsu shark, which is named after the famous commercial for Jinsu knives, which are shown slicing through metal cans. In our number three spot today, we have the Jacolopterus. Okay, I've got three words for you. Giant sea scorpion. Yeah, I'm not going in the prehistoric ocean. This eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross, two large pincers and claws and honestly it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies and they are actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on earth. They had multiple specialized limbs and some of them even had spikes. Like for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish as it passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin and all I have to say about that is imagine finding an eight foot long molt of one of these creatures on the beach right before going in for a swim. You wouldn't, right? I'd swear off all water after that. I'm not even drinking it anymore. I don't want any part of what these guys got going on. In our number two spot today, we have the Tylosaurus. These creatures belong to the family of Mosasaurs, and they have long eel-like bodies that allowed them to smoothly cruise through the waters. They had the ability to have intense bursts of speed that propelled them to their prey, which they could quickly take down. The snout of these creatures is thought to have been quite large and rather robust compared to other species of Mosasaurs, which has led researchers to believe that they may have used it to their advantage. To do this, they might have rammed into larger prey so that they were stunned. This gave them time to turn around and finish the prey with their large jaws. Despite these specialized skills, it seems as though these guys weren't very picky with what they ate, as they have been found with all kinds of remains in their stomach area. Area. These creatures were very large, but they were also way faster and more agile compared to their family members. What more could you want in a prehistoric predator? In our number one spot today, we have the Leeds fish. This is a fish that lived in the oceans of our world from the middle to the late Jurassic. They are the largest ray finned fish and among the largest fish that are known to have ever existed. The discovery of these fish has been a bit troublesome because of the fact that their skeletons aren't completely made of bone. There were large 
large parts of them made of cartilage which did not fossilize. Because of this it is difficult to estimate their true size with estimates in the past ranging as large as 30 meters or 98 feet. More recent research however has lowered this number to the still exceptionally large measurement of 16 meters or 52 feet. Despite their large size however these fish weren't terrifying apex predators and instead were a part of a lineage of large filter feeders. These fish had gill arches that were lined with gill rakers which had quite a unique system of bone plates that allowed them to filter the plankton from the sea water which was their main source of food. Number 10. The Woolly Mammoth What two things are big, loud, hairy, smell like parmesan cheese and frequent the New York area? If you said Ray Romano and Woolly Mammoth then you're correct. It all comes full circle. Starting off with an easy one for you today and folks it's one of my favorites. A creature that's been long extinct. Comedians and primetime family sitcoms. No, I'm just kidding. I'm talking about woolly mammoths, the large animals that once roamed the earth. Since these are so common I thought it would be very fun to do a tale of the tape. Standing anywhere between 2.7 to 3.8 meters tall in the red corner weighing in at a full 6 tons. The beast from the east. Woolly mammoth. Okay, well, they weren't just found in the east, but they were big and interesting creatures, especially since this is one of the few ancient species that we've ever interacted with. Having thick skin and fur made them difficult to hunt. It would take a few blows. However, if a smaller one was taken, it would make for a lasting meal. Interesting creatures. Number 9, Glyptodon. Take an armadillo, size that bad boy up, give it a spicy tail, take away its ability to curl up in a ball and make it stupid looking and you've got the 10 foot long 1 ton glyptodon that lived 2 million to 10,000 years ago. Now it would be easy to mistake this guy with a turtle or a tortoise, but it was in fact a mammal. It also had a soft underbelly that any predator able to flip over this walking Volkswagen beetle would be able to exploit. These guys were native to South America and like I said they actually were around for a long time, living just past the last ice age. It's believed like with most things, us humans had a not so small part to play in their disappearance from this world. We would hunt them for food and for their shells, which evidence says ancient man used as shelter from snow and rain. Number 8, Titanoboa. I actually didn't know this one existed either. There's going to be a trend of large and scary animals here. Well, in the northeastern part of Colombia, a true beast lay still in the jungle, just waiting for a prey to dare come across its path. What would a titan boa do if prey came its way? Well, just like its smaller counterpart, it would constrict until you went for a big nap where you would then most likely be swallowed whole. Ugh. Well, at least that's what horror films would want you to think. As recent studies suggest, they may have actually only had a diet of fish. If you've ever been on a school field trip to a zoo and got to pet the animals, the boa constrictor is always one of those animals. I don't know why, they always got one on hand, just in their, in their pocket. It's weird, wouldn't fit. But Which I don't know why, because if you've ever felt the power of those muscles, well, it would be a very memorable field trip. Just try and imagine that upscaled by 10. I'm glad this one went extinct a long time ago. That's too big of a snake. Too much power. Too, too much. Number 7, Basilosaurus. When I hear the word basil, I think of a lovely smelling herb. Oh, I think of old Basil, a kind old man, probably with white hair and a big bald spot and a mustache. Now, thanks to this video, I will think of a 65 foot long sea monster with a 3 foot head and a bite force as strong as a T Rex. Whales have been around for a heck of a long time and they have had many different ancestors and cousins. All of them were different levels of odd and terrifying. Basil here was one of the earliest identified ones. It was fairly different from its modern descendants as you can tell from these pictures. It had a longer eel like body with that tiny head. It only weighed about 10 tons which is odd for a whale. Being the ancestor of whales. Basilosaurus is a marine mammal, but for a long long time it was actually mistaken for a marine reptile like the mosasaur, being given the nickname King Lizard, which is doubly odd because it wasn't even the biggest whale species. That would be the leviathan killer whale. I think I remember why I'm terrified of the sea, yeah. Number 6, saber toothed tiger. What's scarier than a full grown tiger? How about a fully grown tiger with teeth the size of bowie knives? Wow. Sometimes nature is scary and makes me question reality. The saber-toothed tigers are one of those things. 
A saber-toothed tiger's diet consisted of large animals, so watch out Willie Mammoth and maybe Ray Romano. Obviously most recognized for the protruding large canine teeth that sit outside the mouth even when closed, making for great puncture weapons, as if the large cats needed any more help hunting their prey. Coming into being around the same size as a large Siberian tiger, this is one hefty kitty, and one you wouldn't want to mess with. Fortunately for me and the club of extremely cute gentlemen who cannot run very fast, I do not have to worry about outrunning this speedy, beefy predator. Their extinction is connected to both climate change and a lack of food. Number five, the giant sloth. Megatherium is an extinct species of ground sloth. Locals to South America, they live between the Pliocene through the Pleistocene eras. Basically like a really long time. Yeah, this thing was big and heavy as a modern day elephant, but like sloth form. This massive beast was first discovered in 1788 on the banks of Argentina. The bones, of course, not one. Megatherium became extinct around 12,000 years ago, thank gosh, during the Quaternary extinction event, which also claimed most other large mammals in the New World. The extinction coincides with early America's settlement and the kill sites where sloths were slothered. I tried. Suggesting that humans were out fist fighting these things, aiding in such extinction. Yeah, all of a sudden mammoths are like way less scary. I wonder if they moved as slow too, like a bear the size of an elephant moving in slow motion. So I just like throw it. It's like right. It's like right here. Just be like. There. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, of course, the land of horrors, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s. Thank the Lord. Major factors here are, as you guessed, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. Now it's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures, also kind of terrifying, they disappeared so recently, but it's recent enough that we have a shot of bringing them back. Yeah, I'm just scaring you with this one. I'm like, ah, it's terrifying, right? They're coming back, 2024 in IMAX. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your own front yard. Are we ready for this? I'm not. I've seen a moose once. Very scary, very scary. I was going 40 miles an hour. I was like, that's it. Specimens still remain preserved in jars. Yeah, thank God for those jars. I was wondering what that was in the fridge. A Tasmanian tibia, nice, yum. In the science world, we already have some of the Tasmanian tiger genes present after scientists inserted them into a mouse fetus. Again, bold, but sure, they did it. One guy thought of that, how gross is that? The Australian Museum has been working hard to bring this beast back to life, only they're still lacking the DNA to fully recreate it. So if you have any jars of Tasmanian tiger parts, lend a helping hand for science, please. Number three. Dunkleostis, from Dunkel's Bones, named after paleontologist David Dunkel, who discovered and studied the fossils. Ostis is Greek for bone, referring to the giant tectonic plates looking things that this thing is made up of. Being one of the largest and most powerful fish ever to swim in our waters, ever, these swimming tanks could eat pretty well anything it wanted including other Dunkleostises. This thing was top dog. The first remains were discovered along Lake Erie Cliffs. That's scary, that's like, Right over there. Dunkleosis could suck in and bite straight through any animal alive at the time, from the thick shelled ammonites to the other placoderms with body armor. This thing was basically like the great great grandfather of any fish who eats other fish. They would even bite each other and dent their own armor. Their diet shifted from soft bodied prey, such as whales and sharks to larger armored prey, such as placoderms. Basically, it liked to eat the little crunchy stuff instead of the soft bodied megalodons. What a sentence. Number two, the moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago. See, moa, they were these flightless birds, massive, might I add, and archeologists first discovered its fossil in a cave, just hidden in the very back, right in the depths. Its flesh and everything was still attached. See, these ancient birds would reach about five feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think that's quite petite in comparison, but no, listen up. The birds stopped flying right after the dinosaurs went extinct. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University of Canberra, once the dinosaurs off, they now had freedom. They could go outside without having to make any daring escapes, right? They weren't terrified every day to be lunch. They walked around, they got fat, and they hung out in caves. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating good, you know? They're good problems, right? Scientists have recently discovered MOA DNA from ancient eggshells, so there's a possibility we might see these fatties hit the skies once again. Let's keep them on Weight Watchers this time around, you know? Let's keep them, let's keep them in the sky, keep them. Number one, you're a pterid. Long story short, an ancient huge sea scorpion. That's it, I'm done. 
I'm done. No, no, I said no spiders, earwigs, and scorpions. No, that's it. An extinct group of arthropods that form 470 million years ago with 250 species of its own, the Euripidid, uh, is the most diverse Paleozoic class of its time. This is like the first of the first of the creepy crawly stinger pincher things, you know? They declined in numbers and diversity until becoming extinct during the Triassic extinction event about 250 million years ago. Yeah, thank God. I can't even put a crayfish on a hook without squirming. Called sea scorpions, of course, because of two qualities. Being able to go in and out of water and having two sets of lungs. Yeah, this thing's a fossil, right? This thing just got way more terrifying. They are the largest known arthropods ever to have lived on Earth, ranging anywhere between a foot and four feet big. That's a longboard, Taylor. A skateboard with claws and pinchers and a tail. In and out of the water. All right, the animal kingdom. How beautiful. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Megalodon. I am starting this list off with my favorite prehistoric sea monster, the infamous Megalodon. Megalodons are one of the largest sharks to have ever existed. They were huge, they were terrifying, they were apex predators, and they are the creatures that inspired the tales of Jaws, or the Meg. The teeth on these sharks are so large that they are three times larger than the teeth of a modern great white shark. With teeth that size, you can only imagine how large this shark shark would have been. It's pretty tough to figure out exactly why the Megalodon died out. I mean, they were one of the largest, scariest creatures who shouldn't have had any trouble getting food, but that might not be the case. Some believe it was the cooling water, others believe it was competition for food, whatever the case in the end. While the Megalodon is an incredible creature in history, I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't swimming around our oceans anymore. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Plesiosaurus. These guys are a prehistoric creature that was massive and grew to be about 43 feet long. They had these super long necks that basically took up like half of their body and even though they were so massive, they had no trouble moving efficiently through the water. These creatures had four flippers so our best guess as to how they swam would be sort of like a penguin. Their front limbs did most of the work while the back ones kind of took hold of the steering. Fossils have been able to show us that these creatures gave birth to live young and are actually kind of similar to dolphins in the way that they take care of their young. It is thought that these just may be the creatures that inspired the tales of the Loch Ness Monster. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Basilosaurus. These guys have a name that translates to King Lizard, and they are a genus of large, predatory, prehistoric whales that lived during the Eocene, which was approximately 41.3 to 33.9 million years ago. These guys were actually first described in 1834, which makes them the first prehistoric whale known to science. These guys were one of the largest, if not the largest, of their time, and they were the top predators of their environment. They they preyed on sharks, large fish, other marine animals including the dolphin like Darudon. Really they were able to eat basically anything that they felt like. These guys even had teeth that were various types like canines and molars which probably allowed these creatures to chew their food which is different to their more modern ancestors. In our number 7 spot today we have the Pliosaurus, another massive prehistoric creature. Also not to be confused with the Plesiosaurus, I was confused in the beginning. These guys grew to be around 40 feet long. And about the size of some of the whales that we would see today. These creatures are best known for their insane hunting abilities. They could move quickly and were quite strong. This effective predator skill set coupled with their massive size allowed them the ability to take down much larger prey, sometimes even dinosaurs. According to experts, these guys had exceptionally strong jaws. Some even believe that it might have had a bite just as powerful as a T-Rex, which is of course known for having one of the most powerful bites of any land animal. I'm just saying, these guys were definitely a top predator in their day. In our number six spot today, we have the Jacolopterus. Okay, I've got three words for you. Giant sea scorpion. Yeah, remind me to never go into the prehistoric ocean. This eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross, two large pincers and claws and honestly, it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies and they're actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on Earth. They had multiple specialized limbs and some of them even had spikes. Like for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish that passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin and all I have to say is imagine finding an 8 foot long molt of one of these creatures on the beach. Number 5, Linetticus. It's not a Decepticon, 
It's a Linenicus. Close though. If you thought a T-Rex had tiny arms, wait till you see this old dude. Linenicus monodactylus. These guys roamed the lands of Mongolia 65 million years ago. I'm a fan of this dinosaur. Honestly, it's scary, and I get that, but I would honestly own this one as a pet. It was actually just giving the other dinosaurs the middle finger its entire life, basically, if you look at them. It had a little arm and one finger with one claw. That's what kind of situation. It was like Wolverine. It was like the, the, the chick from Wolverine, the one scratchy thing instead of the three. She had the one. Or Deadpool from the X-Men that no one liked. Also, one blade. That one didn't work. In terms of these other monsters on this list, it's quite small. So, you know, maybe just one little kick to the neck. Maybe you'll survive. Coming in at the size of a parrot, this little guy laid eggs and carved through everything and anything that snuck into their nest. Yeah, it was a carnivore. So, T-Rex, Velociraptor, this little guy, all coming after you. If you don't hit that thumbs up, he's gonna get his middle finger and poke you. Number four, the Glyptodon. Basically an ancient armadillo. Yeah. Now we're talking. With its rounded bony shell house and squat limbs, it resembles a giant dinosaur turtle, aging it between 5.3 million to 12,000 years ago. This thing was old, old. Glyptodon meaning grooved tooth because of its square teeth. This thing was big, 10 feet long, weighing as much as like 4,000 pounds. Like picture a Volkswagen Beetle. This giant armadillo existed in present day North and South America. Though the Glyptodon had a powerful tail and an armored back made of a thousand bony plates, it likely lived a fairly peaceful existence. Vegetarian, nice smile, this thing was killing it. It mostly ate grass and never really had to even worry about getting into fights. That being said, the Glyptodon could easily defend itself. I mean, Captain America's shield for a back and a sledgehammer for a tail. It could literally Hulk smash said car. Early hunters likely stalked the Glyptodon for meat and its shell. To kill it, they had to turn it on its back, basically tipping over a car. Yeah, gotta give it up to the early humans. They were badass and strong. Number three, Spinosaurus. Another Jurassic Park star, and rightfully so. The largest carnivorous dinosaur of all time, even bigger than a T-Rex. Can you imagine that? I feel sick to my stomach already. 93 million years ago, they stopped terrorizing the lands of what is now Egypt and Morocco. Now, if you didn't already guess, its name translates to spine lizard. And that spine was quite long. Coming from me, like, that says a lot. The Spinosaurus would measure up to 60 feet long, and aside for its back, one of the most notable features is its six foot long head. Yeah, not neck, six foot long head. That's an Egyptian god. That's like, this is terrifying. Its mouth was similar to a crocodile's with straight, sharp teeth. He would just do the alligator smack and then just chomp the shit out of you and yours. Paleontologists from the University of Pennsylvania believe that this guy used to swim as well. Because where the first Spinosaurus fossil was found, that used to be the Beharia Oasis in Egypt, a massive swamp. Water or land, I want nothing to do with it. Long mouth, stretch neck McGee, stinky ancient alligator breath, get out of here. Never. Turtles, not even. Number two, Megalania. Megalania. The Varanus priscus. This extinct species of giant monitor lizard is a part of the megafauna that inhabited Australia during the Pleistocene. It is the largest terrestrial lizard known to have existed, reaching an estimated length of seven meters. Yeah, length of a killer whale. Weighing around 5,000 pounds. Megalania is thought to have had very early and similar ecology to the modern Komodo dragon. The fossils of lizards in Australia date back around 50,000 years ago. The First Nations peoples of Australia encountered these ancient dragons, and we actually hunted these things way, way back. These things can sprint three meters a second, Taylor. God, he's so fast. Whenever I'm tired at the gym, I'm just gonna picture this giant lizard just like trucking behind me. From its size alone, scientists suggest it would have fed mostly upon large sized marsupials and mammals such as the Australian lion. Oh, that's good. Yeah, this thing ate lions, dude. With its heavily built limbs and body, a large skull, a jaw full of serrated blade-like teeth. Some scientists regard Megalania as the apex predator for the last thousands of years. Um, yeah, I'd like to think so. It's Australia too, dude. That makes it like 18 times worse. Oh yeah, and it was venomous. Of course, of course. And finally, number one, Titanoboa. The worst for last. Here we go, my sweet bees. The Titanoboa was over 40 feet long. That's two thirds of a bowling lane. In case you want to imagine it in your head. There you go. Every time you let that ball go, just think. Snake, 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 still snake. That's how long it was. It's quite horrifying. And if we were born 58 million years ago, we'd have to avoid being eaten by this thing. Again, we grew up watching Anaconda, okay? We know how scary these things can be, especially when Angelina Jolie's dad's running the ship. He doesn't know the maps well. He's gonna take it into a swampy area. 
snakes that had come out were in the day. Paleontologists found this beast recently. Its fossil was excavated back in 2004, believe it or not, in Colombia near Lake Maracaibo. But it wasn't until 2009 where it was publicly described. Yeah, it took them five years to be like, should we tell them? I don't know, why should we? I mean, do we have to? So far, we only have the remains of 30 adult Titanoboas. That's 29 too many, if you ask me. I say we, like ourselves, have one. No, we don't have it. I I imagine that, I'd be sick. Even people who have snakes as pets, I'm never gonna visit. Sorry, you're alone for the holidays this time. Just you and your snake with a human name for some reason. Enjoy it. He doesn't bite. I'm like, cool, I still don't like him. Number 10, the bulldog rat. Right off the bat, I wanna throw up. Of course, being way larger than black rats, the bulldog rat was thankfully, thankfully, last seen around 1903. We did it, we just successfully dodged these ones. The same time speed walking was introduced to the world. Coincidence? Absolutely not. Everyone was avoiding these big hairy That's my theory. They have two to three centimeters of fat on their backs with short tails and thick hair. There's absolutely nothing holly and or jolly about the bulldog rat, except for the fact that its home was that of Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean. Yeah, welcome to Christmas Island. It's not what you think at all. They were thriving until sailors discovered the island. And with them, they brought infected black rats. So only sailors were responsible for this extinction event. Yeah, they pulled up to Christmas Island and then they released some gifts. Gifts of rats, infected rats, that now made other rats extinct. Either way, I don't like rats. Any rats, extinct or currently living. Next, number nine, Helicoprion. Perhaps one of the weirdest looking sea creatures to exist 250 million years ago. Again, yes, we dodged it, thank God. We got a little close, a little close, but we narrowly missed it. This looks like a shark, but scientists now know that it was related to chimeras, a fish that separated from the shark family 400 million years ago. Again, dodge those too. This 25 foot long fish was first discovered by Andrzej Zarpinski in Russia back in 1889. He got the name Helicoprion because it translates to spider viral saw, hence it's horribly disgusting awesome mouth. This guy found teeth fossilized in a spiral formation. He must have thought that he found aliens. He must have been scratching his head for weeks. Paleontologists all agree today that this was not part of a fin. It wasn't a wacky spinal cord either, but rather this coil was teeth. Yeah, teeth coiled up attached to the lower jaw of the fish. And its grasp was the same power roughly to that of a crocodile. So you can put two and two together and now not sleep just like me. Number eight, dire wolves. And hi to that new Game of Thrones show coming out. Can't wait, here we go. Let's talk about some Westeros animals because these ones were real, dire wolves. About 10,000 years ago, dire wolves were still a thing. We could have owned these as pets. It would have been so scary, but I would have liked it. Canis dirus comes in at around the same size as a gray wolf. So it's not a mega wolf with three heads or anything insane, but it did weigh a lot more because it was eating a lot more, yeah. Their jaws were much stronger, so crushing animal bones wasn't a problem. And they would actually hunt down and eat horses. Yeah, how terrifying is that? If I saw that, I would, <laughs> I would cry so much. After studying their teeth, that was their go-to snack, turns out, nice. Currently, if you're in the market for seeing 400 dire wolf skulls, head to the Page Museum in Southern California. Yeah, they found hundreds of thousands of skulls in the tar pits. Imagine that. Oh, what is this? Thousands of skulls, damn, thought it was treasure. Number seven, the devil frog. Catching frogs is a great way to pass the time as a kid or as an adult who's just, you know, doing his own thing at the cottage. But 68 million years ago, if you saw a frog, you would have to run away immediately. It was bad news, especially if it was the devil frog. <laughs> the devil frog would leave you without a nose. Yeah, it was, got a big chomp. Hear that? It was a lot louder than that, probably like, I can see it spiking up, that's so stupid. It was a lot bigger than frogs today, as most of these things are. It was on average the same size as a beach ball, and they lived on the island of Madagascar. Sounds like fun, but it wasn't at all. They thrived there because no theropod dinosaurs could get there, you know what I mean? And its bite is similar to a wolf or tiger, so really nothing wanted to mess with it. It's like, yeah, have Madagascar, enjoy it. We're not gonna try and f with you. Recently, however, researchers found a fossil of the devil frog and they believe it once had spikes and a turtle-like shell. Yeah, as if the devil frog couldn't get any cooler and or scarier, now we know they had spikes. Throw in spikes as well, like it's a Mario dinosaur. Right now, currently, we have the horned frog, which is a lot, a lot smaller, but even after this many million years of evolution, its jaw is also remarkably strong. It'll still take off your finger, you know? Little guy. Much smaller, but still, a bite. Number six, Mega Piranha. Whew, talk about a bite. 
Here we go. Mega Piranha sounds like a Marvel Comics villain from the 70s. Is this real? Please tell me these weren't real. Growing up, I thought piranhas would be way more of an issue, to be honest. I haven't ran into any of those, and I'm not complaining. That sounds terrifying. Mega Piranhas, back in the day, for starters, they were much bigger than today's piranhas. They came in at about one meter long. They ruled the water surrounding Argentina, so six million years ago, you know, you wouldn't be taking any late night skinny dips, that's for sure. Its bite force was 50 times its own weight, which is scary for a 30 pound fish. Yeah, all that math, it's a little jarring, isn't it? Its bite can outchomp Megalodon, who I may or may not mention in a little bit. Even today, the word piranha instills fear. Our modern day black piranha weighs two pounds, but its razor sharp teeth and its bite force is still so deadly. Also, they've made way too many piranha movies. They gotta, they gotta stop. Piranha 3D, the 4, 4DX. Piranha moving chairs, mist. I don't know. They're doing way too much shit in movie theaters. They have a thing now, it's called smell o vision or something, where you watch a movie and you can smell the scene, which is odd. Imagine watching the human centipede and smell o vision. Number five, the devil worm. I mean, its name certainly sounds confident and scary. What is this thing? A worm from the underworld. Of course, this thing can survive it all. Even apocalypse, probably. This guy's literally from hell. The devil worm is a type of nematode, and it looks pretty haunting only under a microscope. In person, you can't really see it, but then when you look, it's the worst thing you've ever seen. The thing that sets this little devil apart from the rest of these bugs or creatures, whatever you want to call it, is that it doesn't need oxygen to survive. And it can do so in complete darkness and under the most extreme pressure. The devil worm is the deepest living animal on Earth, hence its cool and haunting nickname. Number four, the cave robber spider. Also a cool nickname, but I don't like spiders, so I did, <laughs> here we go. The worst thing ever, welcome back to Bumblebee. The cave robber spider, or troglaraptor, can't tell which name is worse, I guess, is a quick cave predator that has a fun little addition over your standard spider. How neat is that? The cave robber has claws on the end of its legs, just to make it even worse. The cave robber likes to hang from its web from the top of, you guessed it, pitch black caves, and when it feels something a little too close for comfort passing below, it snaps its prey with its claws. One would compare it to a praying mantis only in dark caves, and also a terrifying spider on the ceiling that you don't see. Stellar combo, if you ask me personally. If you live in Southwest Oregon, I'm so sorry. Please don't go in any caves. Number three, the Black Widow. Another spider, just cause I hate myself. We've all heard about this spider, but just how bad is her bite? The Black Widow is not only one, extremely painful, but two, it's incredibly toxic. Now at first, you may not even feel anything. You may think you were bitten by a mosquito. There's slight irritation on the skin at first, nothing too bad, but an hour later, huh, it is much, much worse. Now the ball's rolling. You'll be disoriented, you'll be dizzy, you'll be nauseous, your breathing will become difficult, all because of one little bite. Male black widows are much smaller and they contain much less venom than that of the female. A fact that you may have heard about the spider already that I can't get over personally is that the female black widow actually begins eating the male while they're mating, while they're getting it on. Top 10 ways to spice up your spider marriage. You won't believe number four. That is brutal, oh, those poor guys. Now this is called Latrodectus mirabilis and it's now the scariest thing that I've ever heard. If you do get bit, just relax, take it slow and breathe because luckily we have an anti-venom for this bite. Number two, scorpions. I always say I'm afraid of spiders and that's for sure a fact, but I'm sleeping on scorpions. They're a horrible combination of everything scary. Scorpions can survive in deserts, rainforests, some mountains. I mean, I don't wanna alarm anybody here on Bumblebee, but they're kind of everywhere. I don't know, one might be under your bed right now as you're watching this, right as you're clicking that thumbs up right now, right as you're hitting subscribe right now. A scorpion can be hitting subscribe. A scorpion can subscribe with its stinger, you know? Sometimes you'll find a scorpion completely frozen outside. It's immobile and otherwise dead. But as time passes on, keep an eye on it because some researchers would watch for these frozen scorpions and watch and wait for them to come back to life. They can do that. They slow their metabolism rate enough so if need be, they can live off of one insect a year. Bet you didn't know that, right? Terrifying, you're welcome. And finally, number one, ants. Small but mighty and they come in thousands and they travel up your window and into your house. Ants are so scary, we have to talk about them. There's thousands of species of ants. We've talked about the bullet ant on here before and how their bites feel like a bullet wound. Their sting is considered the most powerful in the world and its effects can last 24 hours. That alone is a scary individual ant. 
but these guys come in all different shapes and sizes. The feature that allows them to survive for so long, of course, they can live deep in the ground, but they also sacrifice each other. That's the thing they do every day. They grab an ant and they're like, Hook, and they just throw them off of a curb or something. If one ant is sick or injured, they'll all decide, as an ant group, that it's that ant's time to go. That's crazy, these guys are ruthless. How wild is that? They do this to ensure the safety of the rest of the colony. So that it doesn't get sick or, you know, it doesn't slow anyone down. That's brutal, that is ruthless. They're like little Vikings with antenna. They've been around for a very, very long time and there's no reason to believe that any apocalypse can hold any ant or an ant colony back. I'm terrified, I spilled a drink yesterday, now I feel like there's ants everywhere, what do I do? 